and uh, I, I know some of you are in different time zones, but uh, it's, uh, it's time for us to get started. I'd like to welcome you uh, to the uh, second in a series of two uh, discussions of the ARL um, Position Description Bank. And uh, my name's Brian Keith. I'm at the University of Florida. And um, there's a number of folks uh, who are in our conference. And uh, we, we may have a few other people show up. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time. And uh, we will uh, record uh, and, uh, this presentation. And it will be available uh, in case you want to uh, review what we discuss. And also in case, uh, in case you have to leave early. I hope that's not the case. My plan is to stop promptly at 4.30. But uh, if you have a conflict, I understand. Um, the agenda for today is uh, first to, to do a, a short uh, round of welcomes and introductions, and uh, then to review uh, some of the uh, conversation topics from the first series, which was the concept of the of the project, uh, the metadata that we intend to collect associated with the documents, and also to uh, talk about some of the functions and features, uh, and also for us to look at a mock-up. Uh, we have a, a number of different um, examples of, of how, the, how we think the interface is going to look, and, and I hope you'll find them interesting. Uh, we're definitely going to want your feedback on them. The overall goal is another interactive discussion. Uh, and I can't stress how useful and important uh, the feedback and comments from the first series of webinars have been. Um, the, the observations and perspectives were, uh, were I, I had had high expectations in that I know a lot of people who were participating, but they really exceeded and, and were incredibly useful. What we're hoping to uh, cover and, and to get your feedback and your thoughts on are what are the needs that this project can address and, um, and to confirm that we're, we're approaching satisfying them. And to also uh, to, to get your feedback on how the system looks and works and to make sure that you guys think that it, um, it, it, it's going to be usable and, and has a good chance of, of being adopted. And uh, so it, if you have some observations, it's always clunky with webinars. But please do uh, take advantage uh, if if you have um, uh, if you have the ability to to use a mic or if you're on the phone, please do that. If not, if you'll type uh, into the text box uh, what your comments or thoughts are, we'll 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 make sure they find voice. Uh, as I mentioned before, my name is Brian Keith, and um, I'm leading uh, the team at the University of Florida that's developing the ARLPD Bank. Um, also joining us uh, today from UF are Bonnie Smith. Hey, Bonnie, if you want to say hello. Hi, this is Bonnie. I'm really happy I to. Think, uh, Bonnie may be engaged. Um, I'm, can you hear me now? Hello? I can. Okay. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I, hey, well, well, thanks. I wanted to say thanks to everybody for being here. Uh, sorry, I was there was an issue with somebody coming on, so I wasn't I was muted and trying to deal with that. But I want to really thank everybody for being here and for participating. And uh, should you have any questions after the session, please feel free to contact me or any of the other um, project team members. Thank you. And also, uh, Lori Taylor's joined us. Hi, I'm Lori Taylor. I'm the Digital Humanities Librarian at UF, and I'm largely a technical liaison. So also, um, as Bonnie said, feel free to contact me with any questions. Thanks. Uh, all right, thanks. And um, Mark Sullivan's unable to join us today, but he is uh, actually um, the person who's uh, the project engineer uh, for, for this. And uh, so uh, regrettably, he can't make it, uh, but uh, he, I'm sure he's with us in spirit. And then we thought it would be uh, helpful um, if we could uh, ask for you to introduce yourself. And the easiest way uh, for us to do that, for those of you who do have voice, uh, is uh, for if you look at the names of the people who are, are um, in the uh, GoTo meeting. Uh, so Angela, if you would start us off, and then we'll work our way down the list. Hi, I'm Angela Wright. I'm the HR officer for the libraries at the University of Alabama. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. J 
John and Dylan, are you able to, uh, do you have voice? We do now. Okay. And what, what institution are you from? We're at Colorado. Okay, well welcome and thanks for joining us. Hi, this is Keith Gresham at Princeton University. I'm the AUL for Research and Instructional Services. Well, welcome, Keith. Hi, I'm Lisa Meckel, and I am the uh, Associate Dean for Undergraduate Education at Syracuse University Library. I also am a Personnel Administrator for Librarian Physicians. Okay, well, welcome, and thank you. Hi, this is Sandra Reginato, and I'm the Manager of Finance and Administration at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. Okay, well, thank you all for joining us. Um, obviously, we have a diverse um, set of institutions that are participating, and um, I really appreciate you taking time out uh, to contribute to this project, and, um, and thank you. So, without further ado, um, I, I'm going to start the review of uh, some of the things that we validated and confirmed in the last series. The first is, uh, as you uh, hopefully recall, uh, we're, we're talking about a web application. Our intention is for it to be simple and um, familiar and easy for people to interact with. And when we look at the mock-ups, I'm hoping that you'll tell us if we've achieved that. The idea is that not only will people submit documents, but in order for us to be able to access those at the institution level and also at the um, at kind of the global level, that we will submit metadata and we'll spend some time talking today about the types of metadata um, that, we, that we're kind of narrowing it down to. That'll be a combination of externally viewable metadata, like a working title, but we also um, can have institutional level um, confidential type of information like a person's name uh, that we wouldn't necessarily want to be known uh, to people outside of our institution. And our phrase for that is, institutions eyes only. Uh, the design uh, includes the ability to do keyword searches not only within the documents but also the working titles and the metadata and also for the ability for this to be customizable at the institutional level to make it as useful of a tool as possible to uh, administer uh, personnel descriptions and, or, uh, and, and other uh, sorts of documentation. Uh, the, Design will, in, will offer uh, secure digital preservation, and the documents will be uploaded and updated by the institutions. Uh, there will be an initial call for uh, documents, and then uh, as uh, the idea is that as institutions choose to adopt this, um, that it's a useful platform for them uh, that they would update uh, as, they, as they manage the documents. And the files could be either text, PDF, or Word documents and, and would have character recognition that would support the keyword searching. And, and you'll see the, the next bullet is in red and, and some of these, uh, some of the text is in red and those represent kind of changes and evolutions and the ideas that resulted from the first series of webinars. The idea is that we would collect position descriptions and or vacancy announcements and or something uh, along the lines of an activity or assignment report. Um, and those would be the documents that we would collect. That came from the discussions um, and seemed like uh, the, the best way to capture uh, the variety of documentations that covered the different positions in the libraries. And we would have uh, the where when I submit a document, I would indicate which of these sorts of documents I am submitting. And that way, if I wanted to, I could limit the search uh, to just uh, the, the, the document types that I'm interested in. The metadata um, in documents, just to kind of state the obvious, but the idea is that we would not include in this database, so it's secure, we would not include um, personal identifying information like people's home addresses or telephone numbers, social security numbers, or the Canadian equivalent of that. Uh, their date of birth, driver's license, um, just anything um, that would, again, be a personal identifier. Uh, and the idea is that there would be some minimal, as minimal as possible, required metadata. And the intention is that we would use this for searching the databases on the global, uh, on the database on the global level. And so one example of uh, 
of the required metadata that we would require for each position would be a working title. And one of the uh, uh, one of the observations from the first series of webinars was, well, we don't have working titles for all of our positions. Um, in some instances, we just have library assistant two, uh, which is a classification. And in that instance, we could use just the library assistant two classification. It wouldn't be as inf necessarily as informative as circulation um, or, or some other meaningful working title descriptor. But in that instance, we would um, we would have that. And, and we assume that a lot of those keyword searching will be associated with the working title. Um, the percentage of FTE, uh, whether it's a, um, a 0.75 or 1.0, um, the, we've assumed from the get-go that it would be useful for people to determine whether it's a part-time or full-time position and you'll notice there's a little question mark and that is um, for, uh, for to prompt our discussion as to whether the folks who are participating today feel is it useful again we want to have it we want to support searching and the ability to narrow this down to position descriptions outside of your institution that might be of interest to you but we also don't want to have any metadata that we require of every position description that's um, not necessary. So do, does anyone have any thoughts on how useful it is for us to track uh, the percentage of an FTE? And Dylan at CU, yeah, we think it would be useful. Okay. Anyone who feels strongly that it's not useful? Okay. This is this is Keith. I, I don't feel it's unuseful. I I just it's really going to be um, going to depend on how how the institutions want to use the database, you know, as to whether that would be helpful. But in terms of filling out a field, it's easy enough to do. Okay, and that's that's exactly kind of that practical. It's a lot easier to collect the information on the front end versus later on we determine the need. But on the flip side. The more cumbersome we make um, the use of the system, the less likely people are um, going to fully use it. So that's kind of the balancing act. So that's a perfect comment along those lines. Any other thoughts on the FTE? Okay. Well, the um, one of the data items that we had assumed that we would collect, um, and based upon the first series of conversations, we're now kind of assessing whether um, it's actually useful or not is the Fair Labor Standards Act status, which is the differentiation between an exempt from overtime and non-exempt or hourly uh, position. And um, so we're actually thinking with the types of uh, descriptors for positions that are captured in three and four, um, that the Fair Labor Standards Act may not be necessarily a, a whether it's an exempt or hourly position, may not be the most useful information. Um, does anyone have any um, real concerns um, or observations regarding uh, the possibility that we would not collect uh, exempt versus non-exempt? Well, let me go ahead and, and maybe what will inform that, and, and we can come back to that, is the idea that the position types, um, the idea is that the positions, we would ask people to identify uh, the type of position and, and presume, presumably there would be a, a none of the above category uh, that we would use for interns or residents or that sort of thing. But for position type, the idea is that we would have a, a professional librarian level position and these would be defined by the institution. Uh, a position that's not a um, librarian but is a, another professional position and an example of that uh, might be a development officer or a public information officer or a budget officer. Uh, and then um, support or paraprofessional uh, exempt level position um, and then an hourly or overtime eligible uh, non-exempt. And so you can see we've kind of weaved into this the idea that the first three positions types would be uh, exempt and then only the last one would be non-exempt. Um, so does, does that seem like a, a suitable way to help us? Again, the idea is that this allows us to search the database, 
that this is a useful way. If I, if I want to know about an exhibits coordinator, um, but I want to only have the positions identified as a librarian, I would search this way. Or if I wanted to search a circulation position and only librarians, I would do that. Does anyone have any thoughts or opinions on that? This is Dylan at CU. Um, we consider a lot of our staff paraprofessional, and almost all of them are non-exempt. I don't think the FLSA or FLSA status really is helpful there at all. This is Sandra from Guelph. I agree. Um, most of our support or paraprofessional positions are non-exempt. Uh, this is Keith. Uh, I would agree. Uh, lumping exempt only with the word paraprofessional isn't really going to do us any good. Do we need to have the why why are you including exempt and non-exempt? Is that because your institution tracks it? Well, the the idea was that that would again uh, allow uh, people to refine the searches uh, to um, assuming we're going to end up with hundreds or if not thousands of position descriptions and other documents and it, uh, allowing someone to do a search for what we presume will be a common um, word like for example circulation um, that the more ways in which people can narrow the field um, that that these position types would support that. Uh, we do, um, I mean, we're required to, as far as administering our personnel, we're all required to differentiate between exempt and non-exempt employees. Um, mm -hmm. And the idea was, though, that there would be, um, uh, that there would be some element of folks that are not in a professional librarian or prof professional position, but that they do have um, significant supervisory responsibilities and therefore might um, be, um, even though they're a paraprofessional position, they might uh, qualify to be exempt. Um, and that, that that might be an interesting um, or useful uh, distinction. Um, but Kathleen here, Could Brian. Uh, would it be possible to have that exempt or non-exempt, um, the two, um, those two qualifiers be part of the metadata? Well, the intention is that, the, that these would be, um, these, are the, these are four of the required um, responses. Um, are you talking about having it separate um, as, um, as a separate field where we would do professional, other professional, support paraprofessional, and then have a separate question that says exempt versus non-exempt? Right, where you could use those for qualifiers, because I, I can see that um, uh, for some of us, they don't have any meaning. Okay. And for others, they, they obviously do. So perhaps if we could be um, flexible and use them as a qualifier, but not necessarily use them. Okay. Does that make um, sense? I think, that's, I think that does make sense. Um, and it's something we can consider. Can consider the other option is for us to have them, uh, as as we mentioned before. There's some required metadata, and then there's some optional metadata, and we could mm -hmm. conceivably just make it optional, to where the institutions that want to would track it. Um, so if we were to take this slide, and we were to if we were to take this metadata field number three, and we were only to have professional librarian, other professional support or paraprofessional, those three categories, um, is, that, is that useful? Y yes, this is Keith. I, I think that would be a, a much cleaner way to do this. And okay. it, does, it does kind of argue for maybe making the exempt, non-exempt its own metadata field if people thought that was useful. But as you said, maybe it, wouldn't, it could be optional rather than required. Okay. Any other thoughts on that, on just having the three position types? This is Bonnie in, at WSU. Um, I guess my thought is that it, it should encompass all possibilities. So I don't mind it having the um, hourly and overtime eligible, but I wouldn't group those if they were there. I, I personally don't see us ever using a system like this for an hourly position. Um, maybe others would disagree with that. but. Um, 
So for us, the paraprofessionals are overtime eligible, non-exempt, okay. which is what I think other, some of the others said too. Okay. Well, the idea is, um, and, and you kind of uh, touched upon an interesting concept, there are folks, I think, that will participate in the position description bank strictly to participate in an ARL initiative and to, to make their position descriptions, you know, available to our industry. I think there are also folks that will adopt it and in that, and will use this as a way of managing these documents. And from those folks, I think that in those institutions, I think that there's an interesting mix of folks who would only use this for staff positions, who would only use this for library, librarian positions, or who might use this to manage the documents associated, associated with both types of employment. So th that's part of the concept is that there would be an internal use to this, but, um, but uh, so I think it's interesting that, that one of the things that's been interesting that's come out of these conversations is the, uh, the different levels of potential adoption by the institutions. But let me move on to the appointment type and I'm interested in, and this is largely in response to um, balancing making the data searchable, the documentation searchable, but not making it overly cumbersome or s really kind of splitting hairs to a level that's not uh, useful. And so the, the concept here is that you would have people who have normal conditions of employment. Um, we, in HR, we don't use permanent, but you would have people who are in, you know, an ongoing condition of employment. Distinguishable from that, you would have either tenure accruing or permanent status eligible. And I'm interested in hearing whether that's a useful um, way of conceiving of the positions. Then you have people whose positions are time limited. Then you have people whose positions are not traditional employment types. They're in either an internship either paid or not paid, or a residency or fellowship, either paid or not paid. And so I'm interested in hearing the, the group's thoughts on whether these are a reasonable way of categorizing the conditions of, of most people's employment in a way that allows us to interact with this database of documents. We can, at the institutional level, we can do um, some option, optional and we can create our own metadata if, if it's useful for us, but from just kind of a, interacting with this database and narrowing down searches for different types of positions, does this seem workable? Brian, this is Angela uh, from the University of Alabama. On the category of temporary, we have, and this is faculty positions, we have faculty, um, if when we classify them as temporary, they have a beginning and an end time, but then we have some positions that are renewable so that they come up for a renewal of their appointment, but they, um, but we don't really call them temporary. So I don't know what definition was considered when, when you put temporary here. Well, I think temporary would, the idea is that that is a time limited where someone has an indicated date either because a grant ends or a project ends or some, for some other reason. And that, a, you know, for regular we could, you know, that that would be, you know, subject to, that, that would include positions that are subject to renewal, but, okay. the, but the assumption is that they would include renewal. Okay, thanks. This is Lisa at Syracuse. Um, the only category that I'm wondering where it would fit would be a graduate assistant. It doesn't, unless we consider them temporary, they don't seem to fall into any of those categories. I agree, um, and I'm, I, um, I think that's a good point and uh, one that hasn't come up and one for us to uh, consider. Uh, you know, I don't know, would it, is there a reason that we would not include that they that if that we couldn't expand internship to include internship and uh, graduate assistantship, or are they so different that? Yeah, I think that could work. in In our institution, internships are library internships. At any rate, are unpaid versus a graduate assistantship, which is paid. But I'm not sure if that means that they couldn't be included in the same category. 
Does, does anyone have anyone else have any thoughts on um, the suitability of these appointment types for allowing us to search this um, repository of documents? Um, just one comment, uh, Kathleen here from the U of A. The terms internships and residency slash fellowships um, I have found are used differently in the U.S. and Canada. So that um, here in Canada, um, for example, at my institution, we do have an internship program that is a postgraduate program. So just to note that there's some um, difference in definition. Okay. Well, I think it's, I mean, one might ask whether we feel that an internship, residency, fellowship, or graduate assistant, if those all are comparable enough, the idea is that someone's participating in, a, in some significant portion of their relationship with the employer, and I'm doing little parentheses with my fingers, that their relationship with their employer is supposed to be part of it's some credentialing or educational opportunity. I wonder if it's, if the concept that that those four things could be lumped into um, its own appointment type because they're somewhat comp no, that's not dissimilar in Lee entirely. Well, that would be fine for me. I'm not sure about others, but uh, but that would work here for sure. Brian, um, oh, I'm sorry. This is Keith. Just quick, uh, has it? The tenure accruing or permanent status eligible designation almost seems to be um, sort of a it's a qualifier of the others. For example, we would call our positions regular positions, and yet they might have permanent status eligibility. So, is the appointment type is it one you know choosing just one and only one or? I, I agree with Keith. Um, somehow that tenure accruing doesn't fit in here because for us a regular professional librarian is tenure track. Okay. This is Sandra, I agree. We could have a tenure track who is a regular appointment. Well, I think what we need to do is to I, th I think probably the, what we need to do is to um, maybe narrow down what the word regular means. Um, to where, to where we've, um, to to where, if if we were to retain the distinction, and there seemed to be a pretty strong consensus that the tenure accruing or permanent status was an important um, distinction, I think maybe the thing that we need to do is to to do a better job of defining what regular means to include the idea that these are benefited recurring employment without a fixed end date and that they are not tenure or permanent status. Yeah, because proven. right now if you eliminate it regular because all the faculty here are also tenure, they're going to be either tenure accruing or temporary. But the other uh, position types that you've already listed, you have other professionals, development people, paraprofessionals, those ones would be regular. Yeah, I think what we need to do is probably do a better job of of indicating what we what's meant by regular, uh, that it you know that, uh, that like I said before, and and I think that may serve. In fact, you know, j just to kind of um, that the the impression I had from the from a from the different discussion group that we had um, was they were looking for much more granularity in regards to this kind of unique status that some librarians and other professional employees have. I mean, and, and to, to a level of granularity that, I, you know, I think is actually would be kind of difficult to administer. So I don't want to lose it entirely because I think it is an important search option for some folks. I have one question. Would there be a space here for whether it's an academic or annual appointment? Whether it's you know a nine-month academic or twelve-month annual, or does that come later? Or well, I guess my my question would certainly the intention is for people to be able to include whatever metadata on the institutional level is useful for them, and and there and there'll be some pre-programmed, but also the opportunities for people to develop their own. Does it is there an important um, distinction to the um, to the to the folks on this call for? between a, what we at UF would call a 9 or 10 or 12 month appointment 
I think that's what you're describing. It is, and for us, for all of our librarians are 12 months, so it's not, I'm not a good one to ask, but I just pose the question, so. Okay, well, we will, there will be a series of surveys that we conduct afterwards, and, I, um, and maybe that's something we can address there. It's an interesting point and one that hasn't been brought up before. The, um, the other, one of the other pieces of metadata that we intend to collect is uh, the library type. This is borrowing from the ARL salary survey, which is the um, law, medical, and all other. Uh, we had originally thought that we would ask people to input dates as, as possible required metadata. We will have the opportunity for people to use date fields, but the idea is that the only uh, date fields we'll use on the global level would be system generated. And what I mean by that is it would be possible for me to refine the search to only positions that were added in the last year or something like that, or ones that have been updated in the last five years or something where the system tracks that interaction. But the, the dates that we require people to put in would be on the, on the institutional level and would not be viewable to outside. Um, and then the functional area, which we'll spend a, a fair amount of time talking to, and that's why I want to kind of keep going. The idea is that the functional area, the, the balancing of the granularity to allow us to search uh, versus making it so cumbersome or difficult to interpret um, that it's not useful. And so the functional areas, um, if we were to look at a pretty specific and, and uh, in, in kind of detailed differentiation between the types of positions. Um, these are some of the functional areas that were presented uh, the last time but in the first series of webinars and some uh, changes. The first is there were a variety of IT positions. We've collapsed it into one in this scenario. The other was to define as a uh, functional area administrative responsibilities. And then the other is uh, branch management. People indicated they wanted to, that they thought it would be useful to, to have some distinction between different management uh, positions. And so the idea that is that administration would um, uh, be kind of a centralized position, but it also might be, um, you know, an associate dean. Uh, and there is the opportunity to check all that apply. And so again, the idea is that we would require people to fill this out for each document each position that they submitted a, a document for, um, and, and, and that this would allow us, as we look at the documents from other institutions primarily, to kind of organize them and to, to refine our searching. Some of the ones that were originally on uh, the list but uh, were eliminated based upon uh, comments fr from the previous series were uh, document delivery, ILS, um, a tech services general position, which I think, uh, based upon the feedback from the last time we did this, uh, may some of these may end up actually coming back. If we do adopt a functional area where we really, you know, kind of try and narrow it down. And just to explain, this comes from, these are variations or um, expansions of those that are used in the ARL uh, salary survey. Uh, and the idea is that these would be useful again in helping us narrow. Now, this is one scenario where we have a lot of really kind of narrowly defined uh, types of positions. We also will have working titles and keyword searching. And that led um, someone who participated in, um, uh, in the last uh, webinar that we gave or web discussion to suggest, well, if we have all of that, are we really, is it really necessary to to include this. If I can search the keywords data curation, do I really need to, to have that as a functional area? And I think that's a good point. Towards that, as a second possible, um, the, we're interested in your feedback on whether we should just have really large functional areas, public services versus technical services versus administration and other. And that, it, and then I guess the question is, if they're that broad, are they actually useful in narrowing down the, the, the way in which we would search 
and try and find a position description we're interested in from other institutions. So all of that being said, is there a consensus as to whether we need to go granular or whether these large kind of mega categories of functional areas work? The functional areas um, are going to be more clear for people. The, the large areas, I mean, you could, I think people would tend to, I don't think that they would, well, maybe I should speak for me. It would be very difficult to decide what went in those three I think it would be easier to look at a more granular selection. Okay, thank you. Any other thoughts or comments? Yeah, this is Lisa at Syracuse. I, I tend to agree with that. I think there are a lot of um, a lot of positions here where I think people would be inclined to say none of the above um, because even at that broad level they cross lines. Um, so I'm kind of struggling with how to respond to this question. Um, and I guess my, my general response is, well, it depends on how sophisticated the keyword searching is. Because um, if you can really kind of dial in to what you're looking for through that mechanism, then I think these broader labels are maybe not so useful. Um, but if it's a fairly simple search mechanism, then you might not be able to get to exactly what you're looking for. Okay. Well, I, we. Part of the mock-ups will, I think, give you a sense of how um, how useful the search um, keyword search will be, and so I think we can address that and maybe come back to that based upon. I, I think that's a great observation, and maybe we can come back to that, um, and that will inform this discussion. Any other um, kind of comments? I, I, presumably, if we get granular, um, one of the observations before was, okay you know, when you're looking at tech services or when you're looking at administrative responsibilities, I mean, there's a, there's more granularity than there is in public services. And maybe, you know, maybe the specifics of the functional areas need to be revisited. And I think we might be able to do that through a survey. Um, but any other kind of general ideas of whether, you know, whether it's useful to require people to categorize each of the positions that they submit based upon, um, these narrower or these broader um, categories? I think Go ahead. Sorry, this, Go ahead. Is to see, this is doing it to you. Um, I think the broad areas wouldn't be very helpful in terms of just searching. But I see more use in something in like the more granular lo level like uh, instruction services. Because instruction could be a part of a lot of our positions, but for really if we were searching for someone we wanted it in like an instruction like leader or something, I would want to go that rather than just type in instruction, which would bring up hundreds of thousands of, you know, positions. Okay. Any other comments associated with this? This is Keith. I, I agree. I, I agree that the broad is just wouldn't be very helpful at all. Okay. For example, we have certain divisions uh, core functions that are part of technical services, which are really unusual. You would normally find them in public services, and I okay. think it's just too arbitrary. All righty. Any other uh, comments on this before? We, I, I kind of get a cons maybe I'm uh, over-interpreting, but it seems like there's sort of a consensus to, to have the more narrowly defined fields. Yes. This is Sandra. I do think that um, it would be better to have the more narrowly defined fields. However, my concern as well is that across uh, or between institutions, we title um, areas very differently. Um, and so our interpretation of, you know, one area could be very different from another institution. Um, so it would be helpful to have a survey, for sure, so that you could see where um, the similarities are. Okay. Okay. Well, let, let me move on, and if we have time, we'll come back to this. 
I want to talk about the optional metadata, and this is again that institutions can choose to adopt, and this is at their eyes only. And so the idea is that we would pre-program ones that we think are pretty common, uh, that people might be interested in employee name, supervisor name, uh, who it reports to, which could be a position number, um, the rank or classification. So we might use an exhibits coordinator, but we would call it an assistant university librarian. Uh, because that would be its rank. So we would have the working title, which we would submit as a required, but then on our level we could we could track the, the actual rank. Um, hire dates and termination dates could be used if the employer wanted to. Position number, the idea would be multiple levels of uh, unit descriptors, um, so people could pick the ones that made sense for them. They could use division, department, branch, unit and that would allow them to organize the position descriptions in ways that are useful. The review cycle, if someone wanted to put in the next date for review so that they could run reports that way, and, um, and, and, and then a notes field. And the idea is that there would be 10 additional alphanumeric fields, that's, a, a, as you might have guessed, kind of an arbitrary number, that people could say, well, none of these do exactly what I want, and I'm going to create my own. And when uh, you establish this on the institutional level, when you go ahead to s and set up or maintain a, a position description, a record, that it would, it would bring that up. Do these seem kind of satisfactory? Do you, do you note anything that we're really missing? Uh, Kathleen here, there's a few things that we would want to add, such as an employee number, but with the customizable fields, um, you know, that's taken care of. So. I, I think that uh, that from my perspective, it's it's all good. Okay, and you would only pick the ones you want to. So if you want to track termination date but not hire date, you would be able to do that at an institutional level. This is Lisa, um, and I, the one that I'm looking at is the review cycle, um, and it's a, perhaps just a question of definition. Um, I'm supposing that that could be used for both annual reviews or for um, tenure or, or permanent status review, because um, we do both, and some apply to some employees and not others. So well, I'm th thinking through whether those 10 customizable fields would address that. I think they probably would. Well, I think one way you could do that is if you found review cycle was just too general. And it, the, I can tell you that it, the intention was that this was the review of either the employee for an annual evaluation or the position description. But I think you could choose, if this was too general and might be misinterpreted by the people using this, you could eliminate it. And then you could say, you know, in one of your 10, you could say annual review for staff. And then you could say, tenure review for faculty and use those dates. That um, makes sense, yeah. Um, the idea is that this really lends itself to being customized in ways that will allow people to interact with us. Um, if you, one of the really neat things about the first series of these uh, discussions that we led was some of the most interesting comments we received came from people afterwards in emails. And I'm going to move ahead from this, but if you have any observations on ones that you really think we should take the time to have as a pre-programmed uh, menu that people can choose from, um, because it just doesn't make sense for you know 50% to have to do customizing, please send us an email and let us know. But I want to move forward to um, I, I want to make sure we make it to the mock-ups. And so the ability to upload um, other institutional level files. So it might not be the three that I mentioned before, the position description, a PVA, or an annual assignment. There may be some other document um, that we want to, um, on an institutional level, that would not be searchable that we might want to include. And so that's a feature that came out of the first series and that we anticipate adding. The other is that there will be archived and access to previous version of documents. This used to say position descriptions, but we've expanded that, so we changed it to documents. And then the system will track um, the submission of modification dates and who, uh, which user was the one that submitted. There will also be a forwarding option to where if there's a position description that you want to forward, um, that you'll be able to forward it using Outlook um, and uh, to, to your contacts. Uh, within your institution. Um, 
the uh, other is the um, support for the establishment of review cycles. That gets into the review uh, date that we were discussing a moment ago. And then also the ability to flag vacant positions um, and to differentiate those from filled positions. So those are some of the features that came out of the first discussions. And you'll see those represented in the mock-ups. Um, the other is the ability to run uh, reports for all uh, the ones at UF and also everyone else uh, from my perspective, but then I could also run just UF and then I could also um, run not UF. Uh, the also is that uh, one of the features people wanted was if I find a, if you guys search this and you find a really interesting position description for UF, that, um, that there would be a, a feature uh, that would uh, provide me as, a register, as the registered person for UF, it would provide my email address and you could contact me with questions. And then also that we would um, include institutional characteristics that are used by ARL like region, and that's defined by state or province, and uh, whether, it's a pub, whether it's identified as a public or private in case people wanted to search based on those features. Um, I want to come back to what else we're missing because um, I, I want to make sure we get to the mock-ups. Uh, this first screen is, um, is a mock-up of the screen that someone would see when they're establishing a new position. And so they would be required to type in um, the working title, but the rest of these are either select one or select all that apply um, uh, pre-programmed. And this would be the standard metadata uh, that we would require for each position. We would try and collect this for each position. Um, and the, the functional areas that you can see are, these are based upon the kind of simple version. If we expand this, this would be a little bit clunkier, but, but it would support this. And so that's how someone that would um, provide the required standard metadata. The next is, if you, if you see, it's the institutional level metadata. And this is for, uh, this is private. Uh, you would not, when you ran a search, this would not come up in the results. And this assumes that the, the mythical institution called State Prestigious University has chosen nine um, fields. Some of those are pre-programmed, like employee name, some of those are ones that that place uh, established on its own as, um, as a useful field. Um, and so only the ones that have been um, selected by that institution will come up and the idea is that those would be filled um, uh, when you submit data, uh, for the, when you submit a new position. And then this is a, a view. Um, of what it would look like. You would identify the different type of document that you are uploading and then you would go to, um, you would, like you would attach and an, uh, make an attachment to an email. You would browse to where that document is located. Um, and then these would be the documents that we use only on the institutional level um, and these would be determined by the institutions which ones would be collected. So. I, can you guys give me your assessment as to whether you feel that, based upon the people you think would be interacting with this system, that this achieves our goal of being kind of intuitive and straightforward? Or if you have any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them too. What's the worst impact on errors? Well, on from, errors. One, from one of the original uh, groups, uh, someone had indicated they Wanted, that that was something they tracked as a data item. It had never occurred to me. It's not something we would track at UF, uh, but an institution had indicated, and so that's used it as an example here uh, to try and, and show how specific an institution could be. Um, so that's, I mean, that could be r really anything. It could, um, but it's it's an example of a institutional level elected um, data field to use. Well, I um, go ahead. Okay, good. Um, we certainly want it to be um, user friendly, um, and so if you have any thoughts on that, we're, we'll be happy to hear those. Let me show you what um, we think the the record will look like, and so this is what the record screen would look like for uh, an individual position. In this position, it is a digital development and web unit coordinator. That's the working title. 
um, it's this institution, um, it's uh, other professional. And so you can see the standard metadata that was required. Um, it's not a medical or law library. Um, and then you can see the institutional selected uh, metadata. And if we were to have 20 fields, then that would be on here. But in this instance, I think there's only nine or so, um, or eight. And so this, and so you can see the worst impact, that data loss, loss of web service, and you can even see a typo. Um, and that is for, um, that's to kind of illustrate. From this, you would see the documents that are associated with this, both the public and the private, and you could um, edit um, the metadata or manage the documents. Um, and so this is kind of what the, the individual record would look like. How would the access level be uh, figured out? Like, for example, if I was the coordinator of this, but I wanted to certainly provide access to the dean of libraries and other administrators. Well, the, the, our intention, and, it, and that's a, a question that's come up before, the intention would be that we would, um, what we would want is for there to be uh, individual um, uh, passwords and, and users, and that uh, the institution could determine uh, who they wanted to have um, access to the database. And, uh, you know, that's, a, that's the classic uh, example that came up. I would want access, but also the associate dean of so-and-so should have access to this. Um, and so we would let the institution determine uh, who should have access to this institutional level data. Great. I think you've done a really excellent job. It seems like it's quite all-encompassing and, and very easy to read, and it looks good. Excellent start. Okay. Well, thank you. Let me um, keep going forward and show you what we think the search is. And, and the idea is that there's a real robust ability to search in a variety of ways, but we start simple. And this is the keyword, uh, the idea of the keyword search. And this is for all institutions. And so for the five or six required fields, we would either be able to search for the words the exhibits coordinator or any, any keywords, either anywhere in the record in the working title only, or in some other, um, any of the required fields. Um, and so this is a basic search for all institutions. I have not narrowed it to my own, which is state prestigious university. And so this, this is how you would be able to find, um, to, to find positions. Um, in an advanced search of all institutions, you can see the search scope is all institutions, you would be able to differentiate and you would search, well, I want this functional area, I want a keyword search either in all or in the working title, or I only want these position types. And so the idea is that this would be based upon, that this would represent all of the required metadata, which includes whether it's a either all types of library or medical and law or any, any variation of those. And also the institutional, uh, the, the ARL uh, defined institutional. So this allows for a more advanced search where you can really drill down and matrix into what you're interested in. And this would be an advance for my institution level and only I would be able to see state prestigious university um, and not only does it include the required metadata, that makes sense. It, it would not include um, whether it's a public or private. It would include um, the, 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 not only the required functional area appointment type, but some of the ones that we've chosen to use ourselves, like position numbers. And it would bring up the ones that make sense that we've identified for our institution. And then um, the search results would, I'll show you what, the, the in, the, what we're anticipating the end result. You would have a header that talks about, the, that identifies the terms you use to narrow. You would have um, a facets feature on the left-hand side that would allow you to narrow the search even more than these, feature, than, than these terms resulted in. And then you would have the results, um, which would include check boxes that allow you to perform some actions. Um, the clicking on a single position to bring up the, uh, that, that record I showed you before, and then the action bars. And this will make more sense in just a moment. So here you see the search terms that were identified, and we used anywhere in the whole document the, the term technology, and we only wanted public institutions for this example. Um, 
Then you can see that University of Utah, Purdue, UF, and state prestigious universities show up in this example, and we could narrow this um, based upon the, the, the terms in this facet. And then um, you see the actual results, and you'd be able to click on, let's say this one is the one I'm looking for, I can click on this professional librarian position, and I can either forward um, that position or others, download um, the files associated with it, or I can open it and perform maintenance on it, uh, if it's mine. Um, so the, the idea is that this is, would be something that people initially might have to familiarize themselves with, but the idea is that it's relatively intuitive and people can come to, come to become familiar with it pretty quickly. So um, does anyone have any um, comments or thoughts on kind of the, the searching, the, the difference, the basic versus advanced, the, and then um, either all institutions or specific to our institutions? Um, does anyone have any thoughts on those? This is Lisa. Um, just one question about the um, search functionality. Can you not out things? Is it the typical and or not? Or how would you? I think so that if you want should, everything except X. Well, I think um, I think we should. In that Mark uh, is responsible for programming that, and he's not on this call. I think certainly we should be able to do that. And, um, he's not, and, Brian, just to jump in, um, the and drop down would be and um, or or not. Um, so that's a standard field, but that that's a really good thing to make clear. Okay, great. Thank you. So the answer is yes. Any other questions or observations? Um, do, do, do you guys think we've hit a balance of it being really where you can drill down and interact with it in a lot of different ways, but it's it, it'll be you know, for that it'll be straightforward enough for people to use effectively. Kathleen here. I, I, you know, I mean, I think that as we use it, there'll probably always be things that we see. But I think, I mean, it looks really great to me. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, well, I, um, I think we have a couple of minutes, and I think based upon the variety of ways uh, that we can search. I, I think that it's useful for us to take advantage of this time and maybe go back to the to these functional areas and see you know and again this is supposed to help us uh, interact with this global database to where I can find a position that I'm interested in you know uh, across the ARL universe um, based upon those search features and that it can search you know all of the required metadata and the documents themselves, is, is your inclination that the functional areas are still useful in narrowing the search given that we're going to have a lot of documents? Uh, this is Keith. I, I would say yes. I, I think you need to have some level of controlled vocabulary in there to make it useful. Okay. To, from, just from a searching standpoint, um, I can just imagine if this truly is a database of thousands of positions, um, keyword searching is only going to get you so far. Okay. Any other um, any other thoughts or on this specific topic, or really anything that we've that we've addressed or should have addressed in this call? I like that you can choose all that apply in the functional areas, um, and I wondered if you could also. Well, it looks like you already have public services and administration, but you don't have technical services on this list. I know it has the granularity of the types go back up one. So you have acquisitions and, and um, cataloging and some of the things that we would have in our technical services, but you don't just have technical services on this list. So if you had both, it would be helpful because I just, I guess I'm concerned about sometimes we have positions that do multiple functions. And yes. so we have to be able to make sure we can choose a, multi, a lot of different things for them. So. Okay. Well, that, that's a good point. And my thought is if we continue down the, the, the path of granular functional areas, that these, at least some of these, will end up back on that list. Um, so any other thoughts or observations? 
Well, I don't want to cut anyone off, but we're very close to 4.30. As I said before, um, the input from you guys um, has been um, has been extremely helpful, and, I, and you've been very gracious with your time, and I want to thank you. Um, this project will be improved by your input. And also, I want to reiterate, a lot of the interesting feedback that we received came in the form of emails that are either someone the idea occurred to them later or for whatever reason they sent it after our discussion ended. So if any thoughts do occur to you, um, you'll receive an email from Bonnie where she will um, tell you that these slides are posted and the presentation is posted. I went too far. Um, but um, I also want to show you our um, the, the email address and other contact information. and. Uh, um, and so please, if, if any thoughts do occur to you, please let us know. The, we anticipate um, kind of narrowing this down and firming it up in anticipation of um, the discussions at the ACRL Personnel Officers Discussion Group at Anaheim, but that will not be the only avenue for people to offer their input on, and there'll be some surveying. Um, we need to kind of recollect what we need to, to validate, and um, so Anyway, I, I, let me end by saying thank you very much uh, on behalf of uh, the project team, and thank you for your input, and uh, it, it, I hope you have a good afternoon. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye, Bonnie and Keith. Bye.